So, uh, our next speaker, guest, which I'm super excited to introduce. She's a 16-year-old innovator from the Knowledge Society. She has worked in projects within the area of cellular agriculture, nanotechnology, machine learning, and wireless technology. As a young person in tech, she hopes to empower organizations to leverage the tools of the 21st century to solve the world's biggest problems. Please help me welcome on stage Isabella Grandich. IKEA catalogs saved my life. Growing up, I didn't really have that many interests. School was boring, art wasn't my thing, and I was more likely to join the circus than be on a sports team. And I was definitely not joining the circus. But what I did love to do is hang out at IKEA. I literally spent all my free time roaming around the store, petting the furniture, just memorizing where everything was, and every other livable moment I was watching real estate TV shows. So my mom would drag me to bed when it was bedtime. I remember being a mischievous little six-year-old, closing my eyes under the covers, and then spending hours just imagining living rooms and kitchens and putting together all the furniture in my head. I was subconsciously training myself to become a builder. And those dark circles under my eyes are scientific proof that I was sleep deprived. But I loved it, it fueled me growing up. And then, when I was 15, the tables turned. Get it, because IKEA tables. <laughs> I joined a program called the Knowledge Society, which is a human accelerator for young, ambitious people to go out and solve the world's biggest problems using technology. Now, technology was very foreign to me. My circle of competence was chairs and dining room tables, but now, my eyes opened to this whole new world of IoT, artificial intelligence, you name it, all the buzzwords. And from that, I began Olympic level training to become the next CEO, innovator, thought leader, someone to build the future. And so I was still building things. This mindset I grew up training was very much building. So now my former bio biography was, I'm a 15 year old and instead of listening to math class, I think about bathroom textiles. But a year later, after going through the program, I'm 16, and I constantly think about the future of food, energy, distribution of goods, and everything in between. I've worked on tons of projects in technologies like cellular agriculture, machine learning. And now I've been able to have some awesome experiences, like talking at conferences like C2 Montreal, Microsoft Ready. Next month, I'm at Web Summit, the world's largest tech conference. And all of these experiences have trained me to start myself on a trajectory towards potentially impacting billions. And what's better than changing the world? Doing it with exciting young people, ambitious young people by your side. See my friend right there on the far side, he's starting a startup to scrape the internet's online courses and make them more accessible to more people and increase the completion rate. My friend right there right beside me, Shagan, she had an internship at Microsoft in Toronto, which she declined to work at XPRIZE in Los Angeles. My friend Cassia does stuff with quantum dots and making solar energy available. These people around me are insane. They're working on quantum computing and AR, VR. And they're what I like to call pre-unicorn people. So a unicorn company is a company that is valued at a billion dollars. A unicorn person is someone that goes out and impacts billions of people. And so when these people are around you by your side, you get empowered. See, we're living in the most exciting point in history. Never before have young people like us had these opportunities to go online and literally take a course on quantum mechanics, learn about gradient descent. But because we have so many tools available to us, we're living in such a unique point where we can use new technology to solve old problems. Let's think about the 90s for a moment. Not that I know what the 90s were like, but <laughs> software was the thing, right? It's If you were in software, you were building the world. You were gonna change it. You were gonna build the next generation of tools. But now, flash forward to 2019, we have so many things. 
all of these emerging technologies for the first time in history give us access to new resources, to new endless possibilities. And so at about this time last year, where I was unaware what any of these things meant, never mind how they worked, one of my mentors from TKS said to me, you're not here to learn about technology, but I was in a tech program. I was there to learn about how to solve the biggest problems by leveraging these technologies. And that day, I went home, and I started Googling. I started learning about regenerative medicine and solar cells. And my mind was blown. This thing that I thought was magical technology has so many implications. Like right now, we're using our brains to control wheelchairs. We're 3D printing hearts. Our AI is more complex than ever, like open AIs, new multi-agent, hide-and-go-seek agents are crazy powerful. We're unlocking the secrets to nature. We're building complex algorithms. We've cured cancer in space. Privacy is more private than ever. We're just doing tons of cool stuff. My favorite word in the English language is quantum. So when Google achieved quantum supremacy, I was jumping, jumping up and down like an over-caffeinated four-year-old on Christmas as if she just received an IKEA catalog or something. But anyway, there is so much happening in the world. And since there's so much happening, we often forget how crazy and how far as a human race we've come with technology. Like if we, I'm, I'm subscribed to a lot of tech newsletters like MIT Tech Review. And every morning I open my inbox and I remind myself that literally 10 years ago we didn't have Bitcoin, we didn't have any of these things, but now we're 3D printing hearts. We have AI more complex than ever, it's crazy. So I decided at this point last year, I wanted in. I wanted to start doing this. I wanted to solve big problems. One of the things I started with was food because I think food is very underrated. Like Ikea's $1, well it's $1 in Canada, frozen yogurt is single-handedly one of the best things I consume on a way too frequent basis. But food is underrated, specifically Ikea's frozen yogurt, but so are the problems associated with food. I mean, it's no surprise and no secret that tons of greenhouse gas, land, water, et cetera, goes into food. So I started researching tissue engineering, microbes, and other solutions. That's how I got started in biotech, I began envisioning, what do I want to eat in the next 10 years, 20 years? And I found myself stuck in PhD level research papers, literally to the point when I was never home, I was at the library, and I loved it. Eventually during the year, I pivoted. I looked into gene editing, played with E. coli and CRISPR in my basement, started learning about the future of birth, because who doesn't love learning about the future of birth? Got into other forms of biotech, different types of algorithms like genetic algorithms and how they can optimize as well as nature looking into computer-aided design, 3D printing, the prerequisite to it. And so over the course of this year, I've really been thinking about how I can build the future that I want to see. As a result, I talked to a bunch of conferences, spoke to a lot of people, and you'd be surprised by the number of folks that have asked me, are you super powered? What's your secret, mini genius? And I always answer with no. Literally a year ago, I was just a regular kid closing my eyes and thinking about IKEA catalogs. Now, I've come a long way, and the reason I've come a long way is not a biological advantage. It's also not a knowledge advantage. Literally any kid in the world has access to the knowledge and research papers and resources I've been through. They have the capability and potential to build the things I've built. But what I was at an advantage of this whole year was a mindset advantage. See, TKS, the program I've been in, is an Olympic level training program for CEOs, thought leaders, and innovators. And that's not just about technology, because with technology comes the mindset and responsibility. So this past year, I've been doing tons of mindset training, gratitude, resourcefulness, all that stuff. But when I think about IKEA's awesome, amazing mission of empowering the everyday people, there were two mindsets that really stuck out to me. The first one being resourcefulness. Since we've agreed that food is underrated, I wanted to use food to explain what I think resourcefulness was. And while I was building this talk, I was eating a box of donuts, which was really fun. And so imagine you had this amazing box of donuts at your IKEA workplace or wherever you work. And then you go up to this box of donuts and you're like, those donuts look great. Like I would love to consume them right now. And you're thinking about it and logically, I'm hungry, I want donuts, donuts are free. And the conclusion would be, I'm gonna eat these donuts. But then imagine if you walked away from the donuts, that would be crazy, because obviously they're free donuts. 
So I think today that box of donuts is like technology. We have all of these tools, most exciting point in history, tons of tools, anything from nanotech to blockchain. We see this box or t box of tools, this box of technology, not that we should eat technology, but we should leverage it. We have so much possibilities, if we should eat the donuts, we should use technology. So when I think about some opportunities for IKEA, there were three that I wanted to share. The first being supply chain management. We have this awesome mission of circularity. We want input to equal output. Now with supply chains, we have this technology, blockchain, or just a decentralized ledger. We can track the entire supply chain and put it onto the blockchain. Now we have data. We have access. Every time something happens, it joins the blockchain and it has a timestamp. So we know when it happened. And now over time, we have this system, the system of records, where we can see where the time differences happen. And now we unlock the possibilities to do so much more. This becomes the foundation to optimize it. And I think it's so exciting and it's so crazy that our supply chains today don't have this. Because if we don't start with blockchain, we're not unlocking these other possibilities. Possibilities to add in different machine learning algorithms to further optimize it, to see where the inefficiencies are, identify those problems and then work towards them. The other, op the other amazing potential of blockchain is with warranties. So right now when you buy a piece of Ikea furniture, let's say in five years you, over, you don't need it anymore. You have a bookshelf, too many books, and you want to secondhand sell it. Well, that person, there's still five years left on the warranty, but unless they have the receipt, they don't get that same access to Ikea's other services. But if we can add that piece of furniture into a ledger using cryptography, having public and private keys, all of a sudden, we're giving people buying secondhand or thirdhand IKEA products to more access to the services. They become part of the company and the community. And now we're impacting the other lives, the people who might not even be able to afford firsthand furniture. And so using blockchain and decentralized ledgers and cryptography, we access a whole lot more customers. So much awesome stuff. And then when I think about inclusivity, bringing more people into this amazing IKEA community that I grew up imagining and thinking and walking around the stores, being so mesmerized by it. I think about human-centered design or inclusive design, this seven or nine trillion dollar market, depending on what numbers you look at. So much opportunity. But right now, our products aren't designed for most everyday people. Right now, we're literally leaving trillions of dollars on the table because we don't have products for everyone. Now, using things like generative design, what if we could take existing products and then give a computer some goal, so we want it to be more accessible for people in wheelchairs, or people that are blind, or people that can't hear, and then we give them the parameters, so the price range, the amount of product, whatever, and now our computers can take existing products and make them better, more inclusive. We can customize stuff for the IKEA customers. Now that's crazy. And generative design comes into other plays of possibilities. Like one of them that I'm excited about is buildings. We can use these algorithms to design buildings that take up more or less surface area. We can give the computer parameters to use less energy. It's actually crazy what our computers can do today. And my belief is that in 10 years, there won't be tech companies. There will not be AI startups. Every company should be a tech and AI company because now this influential wave of machine learning is just changing the way we make decisions. Literally all machine learning is, is data, put it into a model and create decisions. We get data, we can de detect the outliers. We get data, we can forecast. Now with this data, we have so much possibility to use it. And then I think it just comes down to the good data. So something like blockchain and the supply chain gives us access to new data. We have the timestamps, it's more accurate. We see what parts of the system are inefficient. And now what's next? What's next for the possibilities? And so my fundamental belief is it just starts with the foundations. Once you implement these data systems, once you have blockchain installed, we can do so much more. So going back to these three core things that I'm excited about, they all rely on resourcefulness because we are living in the most exciting point in history. We have all of these tools, but I don't think we have enough people that are leveraging these tools mostly because our institutions today aren't training these people 
Like when I was in school, I was literally just memorizing history facts and spitting them out on paper. I don't remember anything now that I, for a year I've been working on exciting technologies, mindset, all that stuff. So why aren't our institutions teaching us about what's happening today? Why am I learning about wars in the 1600s and not learning about artificial intelligence? Because ultimately the people that are controlling these technologies in the next coming years are gonna control the world. Like data is everything, it's our most valuable resource. It's the next oil. So I think it all starts down with the people that we're training to be resourceful. And if we train tons of people to be resourceful, imagine what we're gonna unlock. But I also think resourcefulness doesn't necessarily mean big impact. I also think we can use technology in small ways. But I think the next mindset is thinking 10x or moonshot thinking. So it's kind of like, Google's mindset when it comes with the moonshots and being like, how can we just remove ourselves from what exists today and imagine something objectively better? That's what this mindset is. It's removing the status quo. It's forgetting what we have the possibility right now, what we could do, but rather thinking, what should we do? What is better than right now? So thinking 10X is about not thinking about what's right now, but it's what should be in 2030. One of the mental models that I like to use is I think about the world in 30 years. And then I imagine the things that we're gonna look back on and see as completely archaic. Like humans driving around in death machines or the fact that our supply chains didn't use blockchain. So when you use this mental model, you unlock so much more. You don't stop yourself from what exists today. It's kind of like the horse example. 100 years ago, we were just riding around on horses. Maybe we can change the way we fed the horse and it could become 10% faster. Or maybe we gave it different sleep conditions and it was 10% more efficient. But the person who invented the car didn't start thinking about the horse and didn't improve the horse 10% every time and eventually they ended up with the car. They thought of something 10x better, 1,000% better than the status quo today. But like I mentioned, t the whole thing here is technology. Technology creates this change. But we can also use technology to create small changes. Back to food, food is underrated. This is our meat production right now. We use, we make a certain amount of meat and we use tons of resources. What we can do is we could implement sensors or an added machine learning to the way we water grass. So the grass we feed cows or whatever animals, we can make it use 10% less water. You're using IoT, you're using AI, different algorithms, you're using technology. And you're making a little bit of a difference, this 10% difference, but you can also use technology to make a 10X difference like this. You didn't optimize a cow to get to this second graph. What you did there is you fundamentally changed the approach. You use things like clean meat, which is animal products without the animals. I could go off about that for days and hours. This summer I worked in Amsterdam trying to commercialize and build plans to commercialize these products. They essentially start with stem cells and then you give them all the resources and these cells grow into real muscle tissue. And that's how you create disruption. You think 10X, you're not thinking, how do I make, make a cow better at making food? How do I just scrap the cow and start with something new? So during this year, it really took these two mindsets to click. That is how innovation happens. It starts with resourcefulness at the intersection of a strong vision. Now someone that, you know, the person who built literally the biggest company today, Apple, he was one all about vision. And at one point last year, in the past couple months, I heard this quote, and everything just clicked for me, that technology is an enabler, and it helps us build these things. It's everything around you that you call life was built by people that were no smarter than you, and you can change that. You can influence it, and you can build your own things that other people want. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. So once you realize the innate potential within you, and the fact that literally everything around us, this whole festival was organized by awesome people. This whole company was built by a person that literally started off riding his bike and selling pencils. It's people that make stuff happen. It's people that think they're crazy enough to th do these things. And it's people that remove themselves from the status quo and see how can I leverage the tools to make this happen. And so my challenge to you is to think about how IKEA and these awesome organizations with this big ambitious mission of helping the everyday people can take the tools that exist today and then involve the right mindset to go help people. I know that was the fundamental change in my life 
it was this mindset of not only can I think about amazing dining room tables and better kitchen textiles, but it's that I can combine mindset and skills, my network that I'm still building and all the access to tools I have today and I can make a difference. So a couple days ago, this is literally my dream. I never thought I'd be at Ikea. Literally in a couple days, I'm going to the original Ikea. Ever since I was six, that was my sweet 16 gift or what I wanted my, yeah. Um, so the other day I was walking into the hotel and I opened the door and I was like, whoa, this hotel is awesome. I never thought I'd ever be here in my entire life. What the heck? So I took my phone, I took a video of the whole hotel room. I was like, mom, look at my room, it's so great. And then I go downstairs and talk to a bunch of people and I was like, people, this hotel is awesome. And everyone's like, I mean, it's just a regular hotel. I was like, no, no, I took pictures, it's so great. Um, turns out I'm just a 16 year old with low standards for hotels. <laughs> but last night when I was going to bed and I closed my eyes, I wasn't imagining chairs or dining room tables. I had the luxury to think about the future of food, energy, transportation, and everything in between. I realized that even though like a year later, I have this big ambitious mission, there was one thing that stayed constant from my life growing up, thinking about Cadillacs. When I still, I still close my eyes and I imagine building things that are better than what exists today, designing things that make more sense and help more people. And so I'm really grateful that I've had these opportunities and I can still close my eyes and be a builder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. Uh, and Isabella will also join us later on in the next panel debate. So uh, please <laughs> give it up for Isabella one more time. And now, everyone, it's time for uh, Fika, Fika, and I will see you here 11.05.